Is your mic turned on? And suggest. <laughs> and uh, suggest some of the answers that I've heard throughout the day. I mean, there's a background idea, which is often mentioned at conferences like this, that hasn't been here, which is that there is more total political true information available to the public in this, co in this country, with Ethan's radically important caveat aside. Uh, than probably has ever been available. So the concerns that are expressed are against a backdrop of at least avail more available true information. Uh, Ellen and uh, Mika are partly responsible for this mass of information, as are many others in this room, and yet there's a dream of even more available true information. So the puzzle here is not, and the concerns here are not um, the relative lack of available true information about political actors in America. What are the kinds of concerns we've heard? Um, one that Rashad was just talking about, which we haven't talked about as much today, are concerns around uh, bias and systemic bias and, and bias moving through media. Another, um, uh, Josh and Ellen, um, and to some degree Craig, um, are still concerned that although there may be, that people don't know enough true things, that there still should be more true information. We may have a rough sense of how Coca-Cola influences senators, but we need to have a very, very precise, granular understanding about the relationship between Coca-Cola, senator, and, and bill, and, what, and a bill. And once we have that really precise information, something will happen. Um, there's another concern, uh, which I think many of those involved in uh, journalism have expressed which is some sort of sense that, that journalism as an institution still exists and it can be better. There is a possibility of a better institution. What I was interested in is sort of listening to different degrees of what are the false, there's two kinds of ideas. One is lies that people believe and the other is things that people don't know. So Ellen and Josh are largely talking about things that people don't know. What kinds of lies are we concerned about or what kinds of falsehoods are we concerned about? I don't think, and I could be wrong, you know, one possibility is that we're concerned about false beliefs no matter what they are. So to test yourself, are you concerned if 70% of Americans believe that Stephen Colbert went to Dartmouth? So there's a, you know, if there are false beliefs that, that may or may not have any sort of action impact, is there a concern? Uh, we may or may not be concerned, and people are gonna have different sets of thoughts about this, about randomly distributed false beliefs. So if everyone believes 5% false things about political life, but they believe different false things. So I believe uh, wrongly that John Tester is primarily funded by Coca-Cola money, and Ellen believes wrongly that um, uh, Hastert um, is, uh, has no relationship to agriculture, uh, we have different wrong beliefs. There's no correlation between these beliefs, but, but we each individually have wrong beliefs. If you're concerned about that, you may be more concerned about sort of individuals' own relationship to truth and less about uh, systemic truth. My hunch is that people are not concerned about systematic uh, false beliefs about Stephen Colbert or non-systematic, uh, evenly uh, randomly distributed false beliefs, even if they're about the political system. There does seem to be then uh, a few different concerns that have come through. One is um, mass disbelief that has an obvious social impact that matters. If most people believe the, the uh, death tax uh, kicks in at $100,000, they might then make choices at that, uh, about that. Um, there also seems to be a few mentions of mass uh, disbeliefs or false beliefs about um, historical facts, which is interesting because they don't necessarily have impact in the same way. Belief about Martin Luther King, uh, belief about the Holocaust, sort of a mass, a, a mass misunderstanding of history. And I, suggest, I suspect that has to do with a sense of um, some way it might matter now or some relationship to bias. Uh, I think there's different, uh, people have different views about false beliefs that are briefly held and then rebutted in fact. There's been discussion about the difficulty of rebutting information. 
but if they're briefly held, is there sort of a, a, a wrong there? So all of this to me suggests that um, it may be that the anxiety that is expressed here is an anxiety about falsehood, but it may in fact be that this is not actually anxiety about information. Several people have suggested this. Um, uh, and, but rather anxiety about power. And so if the anxiety is about power and not information, then the kinds of responses are different. Um, now historically, when in this country we have thought about anxiety about power in the context of political information, it's been in the context of campaigns and lobbying. Uh, for what it's worth, and these have been relatively successful or unsuccessful, the kinds of strategies have not been tools but law. So kinds of tools in the 19th century are making lobbying illegal, or the Supreme Court refusing to enforce contracts to lobby, because although that's information, true information in most cases, we do not want to, as a structural matter, uh, allow this kind of true information to flow because we're concerned about power. Um, other kinds of structural reforms are limiting kinds of coordination between powerful entities, corporations, who can then play in telling true information about candidates, um, requiring some kind of disclosure. I am, uh, you know, this is. Uh, I'm Mick Romney and I approve of this message. Uh, Yes, Mick Romney and he approves of this message, uh, that kind of disclosure, which you could then, again, I don't know how this would work in the other information space, um, or actually breaking up power, uh, requiring not allowing subsidiary ownership. So I just want to sort of open up the space for kinds of solutions, because I think there's a, a liberal tendency, and I use the liberal and the small l tendency, uh, Paul Tillich, one of my favorite theo theologians, talks about this a lot, the sort of temptation, the seduction, of always wanting to have more information um, and the sort of uh, the infinite uh, search for more information before we act, as opposed to looking at perhaps power and action. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to questions for our panelists primarily, although. Um, for conversation. For conversation. <laughs> yes. Or I'll call on you. Yes. Melanie. Uh, oh, ah, thank you. <laughs> Well, listening to you, I, I think in some ways um, your, um, that theory you have about uh, false beliefs or mass disbelief runs into one big problem that I see right away, which is religion, which is all about a whole lot of, depending on your point of view, false beliefs, mass disbeliefs, or some people's false mass disbeliefs. You know, like it, this is obviously a big problem for Romney, for example, and yet this is something that's you know, a worldwide issue. So it's not, can't be, and, and also there are a lot of power issues tied in with religion. So I think that that can't be exactly right. So maybe then it has to be more limited to we're concerned about falseness more in the political sphere rather than falseness in general. Hmm. Good point. Chris? I, I want to really thank you for laying out those distinctions. Uh, so two of the kinds of false beliefs are also different psychologically. You know, if you got the date of Mother's Day wrong uh, and someone corrects you, you're not going to resist. You kind of want to get Mother's Day right. The kinds of misinformation that I'm at least interested in are the kinds of misinformation where when someone corrects you, you come up with an elaborate justification of why you're still right. And when you do that, that means that it must have some kind of deep identity significance to you. And that's why people not only believe these things strongly and won't let them go, but why they become associated with political views and associated with political parties and ultimately influence policy. So I'm absolutely interested in that kind and they're, and they're psychologically incredibly different in terms of how they play out for people. Good comments. Yeah. I wonder if in talking about, in those last few comments, we've come across with apologies to um, Ethan Zuckerman, acute cat theory of uh, misinformation. Uh, a lot of what we've been talking about in terms of individual um, uh, solutions to misinformation have come with the obvious, obvious failing that the people who employ these tools are not the people that we're trying to reach. What we want to reach are people who aren't going to know that they need correction on political misinformation, but may really want to get the uh, date of Mother's Day right. Mm. Other comment? Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike Lux? The mic, use the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just thought about the, what Zephyr was talking about with uh, historical information. 
I think I, I, I'm, I'm a person who tends to believe that narrative matters a lot more than than specific facts, at least in politics, at least in sort of public uh, uh, dialogue. And uh, because of that, I mean, I, I I really believe that if you get history wrong, if you get certain even certain factual things about history wrong, a lot of times it deeply influences the way you think about politics because it influences the narrative. Uh, and I, I think if we, if we have a narrative that doesn't work for most people, we, and we in that sense is whatever context, you know, uh, if you're a political party, if you're a political movement, if you're a journalist, uh, uh, but if your narrative doesn't, doesn't fit with what people can accept or believe, then you're screwed uh, in terms of getting your message out, whatever your facts are. Interesting. Does anybody know people who are working on tools? You know that we're, we've been talking in this tools context. Tools about sort of history fact checking. Because I know there's a lot of critiques about um, um, textbooks. But mm -hmm. other comment? I have a question. Actually, I want to push uh, on to. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, to your uh, last Takis. comment about uh, fact checking, when you get into history, it gets a little different, little trickier. Different nations have different versions of history, so actually, you will uh, find many consistent uh, stories uh, depending on your nationality. So, I'm not sure if we can do anything there. Um, so, I, I actually want to throw a question uh, back to two of our speakers, Craig and Josh, um, who who gave Kai, us both. Do you have something to respond? Or, or to was this? Kai gonna? I'm sorry. On the point of history, it, 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 Hit me over this the desire to have misinformation around ah. history certainly is important to many people who wish to misinform, right? right. You, it, we, you've referenced the textbook conversation, but it is uh, a not small part of uh, folks who want to particularly undo civil rights protections, uh, who want to undo uh, of, oh, well the range of civil rights protections, but a lot of stuff the, the folks want to roll back history. Changing the history is deeply important. So, so they ban uh, ethnic studies in Arizona. So they swore, Mother Jones did some great reporting on the, on, on the lengthy and systematic effort that folks did in Texas to get on the Texas school board because the, the, the textbooks, Texas is to education kind of like New York and California are to environmental law. Um, it, if you gotta write a textbook that works in Texas in order to have a national textbook business. Um, so if you can get misinformation in those textbooks, they become a national problem. So history is deeply relevant um, to misinformation, certainly to those who have, a, have an effort. So there's a challenge for those at the hackathon tomorrow. <laughs> All right, yeah, back there. <clears throat> yeah, Andrew Pudding back from Global Partners in London. I, I mean, I, I listened to the conversation today as a bit of an outsider, so I offer you an observation as an outsider that, that the U.S. Is, is thought to be the, mo the developed country with the highest level of religious belief, and a level of religious belief that is normally only found in peasant societies rather than in vast industrial societies. And religious belief is really based on faith, not evidence. Uh, you know, the whole basis of uh, testing your belief in the deity is that you, the evidence is not the basis on which you adopt that belief. So if you take a society which is deeply rooted in profound religious beliefs and in faith, and add to that a political system awash with money, uncontrollable corporate money on a scale never before seen in the history of the world that I can see. Isn't that the key problem that you're all really talking about? That's what I'm hearing. It's about the religious rights in America and the combination of that with corporate money. And I don't see that that's a problem that's fixed by a technological tool. That's a profoundly political problem to do with the nature and identity of the society you're living in. And a technical tool isn't going to convince someone who's a deep Christian that there is evidence that suddenly makes them reconfigure their personal belief system. So I just wonder if, is the conversation in the right place to address some of the problems you're raising? It's really a question from someone coming from the other side of the Atlantic. So just to respond, uh, part of me wants to sort of crawl up in a little ball in the fetal position. Uh, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, I think of the, uh, the way that uh, attitudes in the United States have changed, even with the description, not contesting your core argument there completely. Uh, and so, for example, public attitudes towards marriage equality for, for gays and lesbians have, have, have shifted dramatically in, in just a few years. Um, 
Now that's partly politics, but that may also be generational. Uh, I mean, it's a variety of things. Um, and I think the question that we're trying to address here is, is the digital, uh, you know, the network public sphere, the internet uh, in its commercial and non-commercial forms, uh, can it make the problem more tractable or less tractable? I, you know, so, you know, to, to, keep, to keep the focus on that. Um, I, I was going to go back and just ask a question to uh, uh, our, the speakers in this group, um, Craig or Josh or Rashad. Uh, each of you mentioned that in one form or another, um, the possibility of the market uh, part of this system uh, responding um, and that either you know, newspapers might do a better job of uh, debunking things uh, because it improves their relationship with their readers and presumably that helps their bottom line. Uh, or it, you can conduct a campaign against a bad media actor uh, by you know, trying to influence their advertisers to you know, move a particular polluter of the mediascape uh, off his podium. Um, and I was wondering if you could just, any of you or anybody else, how much of this is about uh, sort of a market, you know, trying to influence the market for information? And how much of this is outside of the market where, you know, foundations like Ford or others, uh, you know, where, where the, the non-commercial side of the space, uh, we, we are not going to clean things up. Uh, we, we shouldn't trust the, let me rephrase it, we shouldn't trust the, expect the commercial uh, media marketplace uh, to fix this problem much. Um, yes, no, disagree, agree? Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Well, I think in a lot of ways the okay. you think about this sort of urge to, to defeat truthiness as, as a market force, similarly to how you can think of, say, international reporting and foreign correspondence. It used to be that market forces were such that it made sense for a significant number of newspapers to have foreign correspondence because the financial models work well that way. Um, what, what the internet has done is essentially disincentivize the Atlanta Journal Constitutions of the world and the Dallas Morning News of the world and the Chicago Tribunes of the world from having those sort of folks, but encourage the New York Timeses and the Reuterses and the folks who can appeal at a, at a, at a larger level. And I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, when I think about what I'm concerned about as journalism evolves, uh, you know, I, I actually don't worry all that much about political information at the national level. I, I feel that there's gonna be a very vibrant space for, for lots of information, lots of reporters, some motivated by, by truth and justice and some motivated by political desires and all the rest. Um, I really worry about the, the state houses and the, you know, the city councils and the school boards because mm -hmm. when you get down to that level, the market forces simply aren't there to encourage that higher, that, that sort of you know, uh, flight to quality. It just doesn't exist in the same way. Um, Joe and Jochen. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we're going to try and bring. Uh, Bill Adair from PolitiFact. I just want to respond to that because I actually think they are. Um, what we have seen in readership surveys that have been done, so PolitiFact has 12 news organizations around the country that we partner with, and several of them have done reader surveys of about PolitiFact and what they like or don't like, and readers love it. And in, in fact, in Atlanta, you mentioned the AJC, Atlanta is advertising PolitiFact not as an online product, but as a feature that you get in the paper. So they have TV ads that say the truth a meter exclusively in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and because their readership surveys show Readers want that stuff. They want to see, you know, what did the mayor get? What did the, the hmm. DeKalb C County commissioner get? And so I'm very encouraged by that because our, you know, our growth and our revenue has come more from state partners um, than it has from a lot of other sources. And so I think, I think the market is, is there because people, particularly if it's done in, a, in an accessible way, I think people want this kind of journalism. I was just, I was just gonna uh, add to what uh, Josh said that when he originally made the presentation, my thought was, he said it's more happening at a national level, but you know, there's fewer journalists working in the newsroom since they first started taking the survey in 1978, you know, in local newspapers and broadcast. People of color, uh, uh, since 1993, fewer people of color in, in, in the newspapers since 1993, since they've been collected. Um, and, and so the idea is, um, and. More and more, these local newspapers, when it comes to national stories, are picking up just copy wire. You know, so you have, I think it's problematic you only have three people covering Iraq and the Chicago Tribune uh, uh, 
uh, doesn't cover it because it, it helps to spread lies even faster if there's only a few people relying on a couple of people to actually, that's what the whole Associated, Cartel, Associated Press cartel would came up during the U.S.-Mexican-American War to spread lies, you know, in, in, in the 1800s, in the, in the mid-1850s. The mid so the fact that they were losing the number of journalists, not, you know, the, I have my issues with journalism, you know, but the, but the fact that we're losing the actual number of journalists, uh, particularly, as you, you said, Josh, the local level, I mean, that's what I'm really concerned, because most people, that's where they get their news from, the local TV station. Mm -hmm. And there aren't local news outlets really. I mean, we're, we're seeing ex experiments in local in the local markets with online journals, but people are they're not really gravitating to that still. They're still going to the main source of news, the, the, the daily paper, and the uh, the TV station. So the local level, I'm really concerned about this. Mm. Okay, Yochai, you were waiting. Um, yep. I wonder the extent to which there are two very different conceptions of what we care about, and that they're at war with each other in the sense that when you focus about fact that is amenable to fact check as the anchor, uh, is this a fact? Hmm. It's critically probably more important than one particular fact or another or a hundred particular facts because it's about the power to shape a shared narrative of what sort of way of thinking and talking is off the wall and what's not. But it's an act of power to pick up the phone to the, to the newspaper and say, write the different word, because I have testing that says that that makes people like me more. That's an act of power, an act of power we agree with or disagree with as a matter of political belief. But I wonder to what extent the focus on fact checking, the imagination that you could have a checklist at the end of which you would be a clean professional who's done their job, not acknowledging the necessity of normative evaluation as a component of storytelling, may be a problem. We may be building tools to let people spend another five to 10 years feeling good about their profession. When their profession, look at the story you told this morning, Melanie, about Burma. The effect comes from mass media, not from the net. When you say you can pick up the phone to so-and-so general manager of blah -de blah blah -de blah org, who is an employee of Burma, that comes out of an institutional demand to say, find someone with a respectable sounding name, with a respectable sounding organization on the other side, then you're clean. The fact is right. This person said this. That's a correct fact. This person is in this organization called this way. That's, an, that's a fact. After that, I'm clean. And that institutional acceptance within traditional journalistic modes of that being, that's how I maintain my professional integrity, is what pushes this idea of truth being about fact check, as opposed to the relevant question being about how we shape the narrative. And, and I think we need to not only keep those separate, but understand that an emphasis on one undermines the possibility of seeing that the real action, if that's what we think that the where the real action is, is entirely in the other. Mm. Response, yeah. Mm. Denise. There's one other part of the story we keep forgetting, is that the, the onus on determining truth and truthiness is not just in technological fixes, but also education, particularly of young people. We want to remember to get people while they're young and help them learn for themselves to determine how to evaluate information. Mm -hmm. Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Stites from the Banyan Project. It strikes me that if we put this in a broad historical context about journalism, it, it begins to take on a, a, a bigger frame. It wasn't really until about World War I that newspapers, that most newspapers, had reporters. The whole idea of checking facts, of, of verifying information was essentially not there. Uh, the introduction of, 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 uh, of uh, propaganda techniques in World War I actually drove the invention of the idea of reporters as something that's part of our, our, our journalism today. I think where we find ourselves is in a, in, in a cultural and social situation where the propagandists of today operating in our culture here now have become so sophisticated that they have captured the journalistic model that has been essentially 
in effect since after World War I. And they have wrecked it by essentially manipulating the he said, she said aspect of the culture. This idea of, of, uh, of disengagement, of, of uh, dispassion, and all the other stuff that we, we actually know isn't true. I think that we're dealing here around the edges of a extremely large shift in what journalism is. And I think that, okay, okay it's, hits it on the nose. Is this, is this facts? Is it narrative? Is it all of these things? I think that all of these questions are in process of becoming something we don't quite know what it is yet. But it's wonderful that we're in this room poking at it and maybe some more truth about what journalism is, is going to come out of exercises like this. Hmm. Other comments? Yep. Wendell, you got the first word. You're heading into the last word section of the, no, of the day. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things that I think is important to keep in mind is that uh, a lot of money is paid to manufacture these lies. There's a lot of money uh, for organizations like the ones I used to work for. Part of that money goes to make sure that those lies or that, that misleading, misleading, misleading information packs an emotional wall up. Mm. Uh, that's why you have phrases like death panels when the government take over the health care. <coughs> These, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of time is spent to make sure that those, those terms do resonate emotionally with people. What we're trying to do here, uh, there's a bit of a disconnect. And it may be, it may be one of those intractable problems, but when you're trying to overcome uh, someone who has a taken as, as belief something like a death panel and trying to <coughs> communicate facts, it's kind of like this. You've got uh, you're trying to refute some emotional, uh, emotionally received information with factual information. And it's just not quite getting through, I don't think, to, to, uh, to, to, to really persuade people that what they, have, uh, been, what they have been led to believe is true. Uh, where am I going with this? I think that there probably needs to be some uh, greater work by uh, journalists and others to expose where this is coming from and to determine can the internet do anything uh, to try to counter the, uh, the lies that are crafted that way in language and in a way that people can actually understand and understand how they are being misled. Mm -hmm. Okay, again? Just a it gets a little. clarification and, 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 and the to respond to Ethan's challenge of uh, actionable. Mm -hmm. um, what it means is that it, we, we can select from the various set of tools. So when Paul Resnick talks about clustering <coughs> of stories and identifying stories by cluster in one tool and talking about diagnosing as left or right certain, um, 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 uh, certain characteristics, when, when, when um, uh, we talk about uh, uh, journalism.co.uk, uh, 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 the mapping of the, the stories in terms of the press releases. These are ways that don't focus on facts, but are efforts to try to combine tools, like the one from Yahoo Research in Barcelona that I used to show which was right-wing and which was left-wing searches on Yahoo, that tried to diagnose a pattern of words, a pattern of stories, a pattern of memes, and map them both to political parties, to press releases, to lobbying efforts, so that the armor that we walk with us, or perhaps the persuasion, is one that is aimed toward trying to diagnose means and linguistic moves and narratives and similarity and stories onto a particular position. So we know who is trying to persuade us with this theme. So it's a very different cluster of tools in terms of what it's trying to identify. There's one more comment, Sasha. Yeah. Sasha, I think this is our last comment. Yeah, it's just sort of, I guess, a provocation for tomorrow's hackathon. So one of the things we've been doing in the back channel is extracting all of the proposals and ideas people have and putting them into a matrix of things we'll play with tomorrow. And that one way, a thought experiment uh, that I'd like to invite people to do, even if you can't come tomorrow, is also try and consider uh, sort of flipping it on its head if you were going to attempt to spread falsehoods, you know, what tools and mechanisms would you use? What tools would you want to design to do that? And that might be an interesting way uh, you know, for us to enter into a conversation about how we could counter it. Great. All right.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you to our uh, panelists, and, and we're going to hand the baton off to our hosts. So we're going to bring some conclusion.